What do you know about the Deathly Hallows? The thing that the final book in the Harry Potter series was focused on was the Deathly Hallows. It was beautifully animated and so well done in the films, but they didn't cover the entire story. There's so much more to it, and it goes so deeply that it actually links Harry and Voldemort as distant relatives. In this video, I'm going to discuss the Deathly Hallows and explain to you their creation, all the way to where they end up at the end of the series. The story starts with the tale of the three brothers, or the Peveril brothers. The three cheat death, and death pretended to congratulate them, and gave each one of them a prize. Antioch Peveril, the oldest brother, asked for a wand more powerful than any. The second brother, Cadmus Peveril, asked for a way to bring the love of his life back from the dead, and death gave him a stone that could do just that. And finally, Ignotus Peveril asked for a way to leave that day and not be followed by death for the rest of his life, so death gave him part of his own invisibility cloak. Just as death had planned, the objects he had given to Antioch and Cadmus led to their deaths. Antioch bragged of his invincibility and was killed by someone who wanted the wand for themselves. Cadmus ended up committing suicide to join the love of his life after the stone had given her back, but it wasn't the same. He was unable to touch her and she was miserable being back among the living. Ignotus Peveril, however, lived the rest of his life hidden from death, just as he had planned, until he passed the cloak down to his own son and greeted death like an old friend. The legend says that if you possess all three of the Deathly Hallows, the wand, the stone, and the cloak, then you are the master of death. Together, they make one the master of death. When Harry asked Dumbledore if the Peveril brothers and the tale of the three brothers were real, Dumbledore responded saying, Oh yes, I think so. Whether they met death on a lonely road, I think it more likely that the Peveril brothers were simply gifted, dangerous wizards who succeeded in creating those powerful objects. The story of them being death's own hallows seems to me to be the sort of legend that might have sprung around such creations. So what came of the three deathly hallows? Both the stone and the cloak were kept in the family and were passed down generation after generation. For the cloak, it was passed down to Ignotus Peveril's family until they had no more male heirs, so it was eventually passed down to the daughters, which eventually led to the Potter family when one of the female heirs married Hardwin Potter. Skipping ahead to the 20th century, it was passed down to Fleamont Potter and then his son James Potter, and I'll continue with that in a minute. After Cadmus Peveril, the Resurrection Stone was fitted to a ring, and that ring was passed down as a family heirloom for the Peveril family and eventually to the Gaunt family. As the ring was passed down, no one knew the true nature of its abilities and what it was capable of as one of the Deathly Hallows. Eventually, it was passed down to Marvolo Gaunt, who was Tom Riddle's, or Lord Voldemort's, grandfather. Marvolo passed down the ring to his son Morphin Gaunt. When Voldemort was still in school at Hogwarts, he stole the ring from Morphin and used it to make one of his Horcruxes. He then hid it in the house that his grandfather, uncle, and mother had lived in and put magical enchantments and protections on it to keep it safe. The reason these two hollows are so interesting is because they link the hero of the story and the villain of the story. Because both hollows, the cloak and the stone, were passed down to both Harry and Voldemort's family, we know that Harry is descendant of Ignotus Peveril, and we know that Voldemort is descendant of Cadmus Peveril. Ignotus and Cadmus were brothers, meaning that Harry and Voldemort are descendants from the same family, which means that they're actually related. While the cloak and the resurrection stone were kept in the family, the Elder Wand was not. Antioch Peveril, the original holder of the Elder Wands, killed a man in a bar who he had a quarrel with in the past, and he drunkenly bragged about his power. And as I said earlier, he was killed in his sleep, and the murderer took the wands, making it leave the family. The way wands work in the wizarding world is if you win a duel, overpower them, or if you kill them, you become the possessor of their wands, and the wand will serve you. As we learned in the first book, The wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. It's not always clear why. If you aren't chosen by the wand, or you didn't defeat the person whose wand you stole, it won't work correctly for you, which will be important later on. The man that killed Antioch became the rightful owner of the wand because he had killed the previous owner. The wand was passed through various owners throughout many years, usually through violent means. The wand had many names other than the Elder Wand throughout the many years of it being passed from owner to owner, such as the Death Stick or the Wand of Destiny. There are many things splattered throughout wizarding history of the wand's bloody trail. The first recorded mention of the wand in wizard history after Antioch Peveril was Emmerich the Evil, who was an aggressive wizard who terrorized the south of England in the Middle Ages. He was slaughtered in a ferocious duel by Egbert the Egregious, who 
took possession of the Elder Wands after his defeat of Emmerich the Evil. A century later, a wizard named Godelot was the next known master of the wands. He used the wand as a guide to learn, and let the wand teach him about the dark arts. He would use that information to write a book called Magic Most Evil that was all about dark magic. Godelot was locked in the attic by his own son, who left his father there to perish so that he would have possession over the wands. The next owner to have possession of the wand was a wizard named Barnabas Deverell in the 18th century. He used the wand to make a reputation for himself as a fearsome warlock. He was killed by a wizard named Loxias, who was the next owner of the wand and was the one that named it the Death Stick. It's unknown exactly who killed him because he was so well known that many people claimed to have killed him, including Loxias' own mother. Now we get to more recent history. A wizard named Gregorovich had the wand in the late 1800s. He's a wand maker, so naturally he was intrigued by the wands and tried duplicating its powers. He spread the word that he had the wand and that he was trying to replicate it, hoping that he would bring in more business. This drew the attention of a boy named Gellert Grindelwald, who snuck into Gregorovich's shop, stunned him, ensuring mastery over the wands, took the Elder Wand, and jumped out a window. Gregorovich never knew who stole it. A little bit before that, Grindelwald and Albus Dumbledore had become close, and they bonded over the pursuit of the Deathly Hallows. This eventually led to the death of Ariana, Dumbledore's little sister, and Grindelwald fled immediately. And that's when he went to get the Elder Wand from Gregorovich. Grindelwald used the wand as he became one of the most dangerous and well-known wizarding tyrants. Dumbledore answered pleas of the wizarding world to face Grindelwald and to stop his reign of terror. Dumbledore defeated him in battle, and he gained possession of the Elder Wands. Dumbledore was always fascinated in the Hallows, even in his later years. Although he had given up pursuit of the Hallows years earlier, when he saw James Potter's cloak, Dumbledore asked if he could borrow it to examine it. It was far older and far more perfect than any invisibility cloak that Dumbledore had ever seen, and he knew it was one of the Deathly Hallows. James was killed shortly after Dumbledore asked to borrow it, and Dumbledore was now in possession of two of the three Hallows. Ten years later, when James's son Harry came to Hogwarts, Dumbledore was still in possession of the cloak, and he anonymously gave it to Harry for Christmas to ensure that it would continue to be passed down in its rightful family. I wonder who gave it to him. There was no name. It just said, use it well. Many years later, Dumbledore discovered Voldemort's secrets about his Horcruxes, and he found the ring with the Resurrection Stone in Voldemort's grandfather's house. He got past the magical enchantments and took it. When he realized it was the Resurrection Stone, his obsession with the Deathly Hallows took over, and he put the ring on completely forgetting it was a Horcrux. It poisoned him, and Snape stopped it from spreading past his hand, but Snape told him he only had a year to live. Dumbledore then destroyed the Horcrux with the Sword of Gryffindor. Because he was still in possession of the Elder Wands, and because he was going to die anyway, Dumbledore devised a plan to have Snape kill him. This plan ensures that Snape would not defeat Dumbledore, because Dumbledore asked Snape to kill him. So there would be no true owner of the wands, because no one would have beaten Dumbledore. And the wand's dangerous power would never be abused again. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. Draco Malfoy disarmed Dumbledore before Snape killed him. This meant that Draco defeated Dumbledore, and therefore Draco won possession of the Elder Wands. The wand, however, was buried with Dumbledore until Voldemort took it out of his grave. Later that year, Harry overpowered Draco, who was still the rightful owner of the wand, and since Harry overpowered him, it made Harry the rightful owner of the Elder Wand because he beat its previous master. It was Draco who disarmed Dumbledore that night in the Astronomy Tower. From that moment on, the wand answered him until the other night when I disarmed Draco. So that means it's mine. Harry was now the master of two of the three Deathly Hallows, the Cloak and the Elder Wands. Before his death, Dumbledore took the snitch that Harry caught in his first Quidditch game and put the Resurrection Stone inside of it. He then put it in his will to Harry. When Harry got it, he saw a message on it that said, I open at the close. Right before Harry was going to let himself die, he realized what the message meant. He spoke the words, I'm ready to die and the snitch opened to reveal the Resurrection Stone. Harry was now in possession of all three of the Deathly Hallows, making him the Master of Death. There's a theory that Harry didn't die because he was the Master of Death, owning all three of the Deathly Hallows, which is an interesting theory, but unfortunately it's not the real reason why Harry didn't die, which many people don't know because it's become such a well-known and accepted theory. The real reason he didn't die was actually explained in the chapter King's Cross in the final book. When Harry is hit by the Killing Curse, he sees Dumbledore, who explains the exact reason why Harry didn't die, and it has nothing to do with the Deathly Hallows or being the Master of Death. 
Dumbledore says it's because of the protection that his mother gave him when she sacrificed herself to save Harry when he was a baby. The enchantment was supposed to work until he turned 17, due to him calling the Dursley's house his home. As long as he lived with Petunia, who shared Lily's blood, the protection lived on. The protection was supposed to go away when he turned 17 and no longer called the Dursley's house his home. However, the protection doesn't go away the way it was supposed to. This is because Voldemort used Harry's blood to come back in Goblet of Fire. The Dark Lord shall rise again. Dumbledore says his body keeps her sacrifice alive. And while that enchantment survives, so do you. So because Voldemort put Harry's blood in his own body, the protection lives on inside of Voldemort, continuing Lily's protection for Harry, which is why he didn't die. Another cool theory centered around the Deathly Hallows is that Voldemort, Snape, and Harry are representations of the three brothers. Voldemort died for power like Antioch, Snape died for love like Cadmus, and Harry greeted death like an old friend like Ignotus. In the end, because Harry was the true master of the Elder Wands, which Voldemort was still using, the wand backfired on him because it refused to kill its master at the time, which is ultimately what led to Voldemort's downfall and Harry and Voldemort's final fight. So what happened to the three Deathly Hallows at the end of the series? For the stone, according to a Q&A, Rowling said that Harry dropped the stone in the Forbidden Forest, and the stone was pressed into the ground by centaurs while they were charging into battle for the Battle of Hogwarts. The cloak was kept by Harry, and he would pass it down to his own son. As for the Elder Wands, Harry used it to fix his own original wands that had been broken earlier in the final book. Normally a wand is unrepairable, but since it was the most powerful wand in the world and Harry was the true master of it, Harry was able to repair his own wand successfully. Harry then snapped the Elder Wand in half to make sure that no one is ever able to abuse its power again. Harry gave up the power to be the master of death, something that not even Albus Dumbledore could resist, showing just how incredible and pure-hearted the hero of our favorite story is. Harry. Right.